So let me go back. One quick question. So do you do you you don't come to the pulpit with a manuscript? Uh, do you come? I, I, I noticed you had one for the eulogy. So do yes. you normally have a manuscript? There were days that I did not use a manuscript at all. But as time goes on, I, I was getting older and I needed to have uh, a manuscript. It got too hard for me to preach without a manuscript. So, yes, I do have notes. Right. And it's amazing, you know, because, you know, I, I say to preachers, you know, even if a person comes there and stands there with a Bible and take, you know, takes a small Bible and speaks extemporaneously, for most people, there's a written manuscript behind that somewhere. People are writing stuff because writing is a process of, of, uh, of clarifying. So thank you for, you know, continuing to reinforce uh, to our audience the importance of writing an actual manuscript as to whether or not you go to the pulpit with the manuscript is a personal choice, but writing uh, clarifies the, the, the thinking process. Right, exactly. Let's go to, thank you so much. You've been so patient and uh, we've been at it an hour and uh, I want to go to the Aretha Franklin eulogy. I want to talk, you know, I, I call that a dangerous sermon. And um, I, I want to to ask you, uh, first of all, this is from the book. Uh, I told you all I did a whole chapter on the, on the sermon. I watched that sermon at least 20, I watched your eulogy at least 20 times. I almost can recite it myself. And uh, I watched the um, both press conferences and you know, I really put a lot of time into, uh, as a person who's supposed to be a scholar, you know, I try to be very balanced and I could see that you had put a lot of time into that and that you really were intending to persuade the African-American community. So I, had, I wrote my own interpretation of what you were intending to persuade the uh, African-American community of. That was your primary audience. You were speaking to everybody, but the primary audience, from my mind, was the African-American community. So tell me, what, what was your message and what were you trying to persuade the African-American community of? Well, I think that where I was at the time is the main reason why I preached it the way that I did. I was preaching a series of sermons in my church on Black America, where we needed to be, why we weren't achieving, all of those kinds of things. I have quite a few sermons, Slaves Without Chains, uh, Watchmen, What of the Night, Mm -hmm. uh, Jonah, the story of Jonah is the story of our race. I preached a whole lot of sermons about that. It all started, um, Dr. Thomas, with um, the killing of Michael Brown back in August of 2014. He was killed, if you remember, mm -hmm. in Ferguson, Missouri by mm -hmm. a police officer. And I was on my way to the restroom early in the morning, like, and came back and couldn't go to sleep, flipped the TV on. And our people were just protesting, jumping up on cars, uh, being violent and vicious. And as clear as I'm looking at you, uh, the, the, the voice of God spoke to me and said that, you've got to do something about this and something must be done. Hmm. I guess that might be the reason why you heard that so much in that sermon as you referenced a little earlier in our discussion mm -hmm. and that it had to come from the church. And so it bothered me to the point that I wanted to know what could I do? I thought about calling for pastors to go with me down to Phillips Arena and we picket and we um, call for a boycott against um, doing business with white people and that we do business with just black people. What do I do? And, and then I thought that I would uh, seek out Sam Chan. I called Dr. Sam Chan and told him what I was wanting to do. And he listened patiently to me until I finished. And he told me when I finished, he said, Brother Williams, if you do what you're talking about doing, going to Phillips Arena, Arena, bringing all of these people together, as soon as you finish, you're going to fail and it'll all fizzle out. That struck a nerve with me. And so um, I began seeking from him, what could I do and how could I go about it? 
he says, well, Atlanta. He says, how many count governments make up Atlanta? I said, six. And there are six counties, and each of them have their own government. They have a CEO, a chairman. They have their own uh, chief of police. Each county has its own superintendent of schools. And so he said, well, if you can manage somehow to get those people to come in, they'll tell you what you should do. And so I went on a mission to try to see what I could do. I got people to call these people to make, uh, to make invitations for them to come. And they did. They met me at the Commerce Club, 191 Peachtree Street in Atlanta at, on the 49th floor. I had every CEO, every chief of police, and every superintendent of school that met me in the Commerce Club and I asked them two questions. Question one, what do you perceive to be the three greatest needs of the African-American community that you lead? And question number two was, what do you think the church can do about it? And I told them that I did not know what to do about Black America's situation, but I knew that they knew and I wanted them to permit me to come to them on my own personal listening to each one of them, and I wanted them to answer those questions for me when I came. And they all said that they would allow me to come to them on a listening tour. And so I had my staff and people to schedule a time for me to come. And the first one I went to in November of 2014, and the last one, it was 22 of them, I went to them sometime in March of 2015. And when they finished giving me the information, I turned that information over to Dr. Mary Langley, who was the chairman of the health department of Mohaw School of Medicine. And they kicked out to me what is called a qualitative analysis. And in the qualitative analysis that they uh, gave me, three things came forth, family, parenting and something else. I can't remember the other one right now. And that clicked with me. Parenting was the key because I began to realize that if we could change the culture of Black America, if we could somehow um, assist parents who need their children mentored, if we could do something from the pulpit, that would accentuate our people coming out of the destituted way that we were going as a race that it may turn around. And so I called pastors together, showed them what had happened. There were pastors in that meeting that day at the Commerce Club as well. And they supported me very well. I took it around to different churches, had statisticians to come in and take statistics as we talked classes on parenting and went through the whole thing. That was in 2015, 16, 17. And so much of it was in the bloom at the time of Aretha's uh, funeral. So when she asked me about preaching her funeral, and incidentally, uh, the family did not ask me to preach her funeral. She asked me before she died to preach her funeral. And I told her that, don't talk about that. We're going to be our, no, I just want you to hear, just, you preach daddy's funeral. And I just want to know, will you preach mine? I said, well, Aretha, if you are still around, oh, I'm still around when your time comes to go, I'll be honored to do that. Well, when she started going down in terms of being real ill, she had one of the family members to call me and they were talking about all the things that were going to be happening. And oh yeah, by the way, you are preaching the funeral. I said, well, just let her know that I'll be glad to preside. I'll be glad to sing. I'll be glad to do remarks. And they cut me off. They said, no, she wants you to preach the funeral. So after towing over, I had a, this book talks about how I really agonized over 
the selection of the sermon as to what I was going to preach about and how I was going to go about preaching the sermon, I thought about um, that text, you know, where um, the woman with the alabaster box came to Jesus and broke the alabaster box and to anoint his feet. I figured if I developed a text on that, that that would be a unique way of doing it, but it didn't set well with me. And I felt that the only thing that I could do was somehow mesh what I was about as it relates to the status of Black America with Aretha, the Queen of Soul. And it dawned on me that with all she had done for the civil rights movement and, and all she had done for the legacy of Dr. Martin Luther King and others and what Dr. Franklin had done, that she had earned the title of Queen of Soul. And I took the idea of her subjects, Black America, uh, had, had really deceived the queen that she could not sit on her throne because the race over which she ruled had come to where they were unknown, so to speak. And I developed it from that point and meshed it all together. And that's the background, mm -hmm. the real background of how I came to preach it the way that I did. So when you got the, the bifurcated response back, what, what, what did that, I mean, nobody does a eulogy you know, necessarily, I guess, to be controversial or to get. So what was your response when there was such a wide variety of responses? You know, some people saying you're being prophetic, some folks saying you need to be tarred and feathered. So what, what, was, what was your response? I preached what I was led to preach. And I was satisfied with what I had done. And if I had to do it all over again with everything being the way that it was, I would have done the same way. I, um, what did I do? I preached it again at my church. I got all the mileage out of it <laughs> that I could get. And except I made one point when I preached it at my church that I didn't make when I preached it at the funeral. And that was that both Aretha's father, Dr. C.L. Franklin, and Martin Luther King's mother, Alberta King, both died as a result of black on black crime. That was one thing that I didn't say in the eulogy that I did say when I preached it at my church again the second time. So please go right on with other questions if you if you like. Yeah. So did, did you have a sense of why there was so much opposition, you know, in terms of um, you know, to what you said? Why why was there such you know, opposition? Well, I think because we don't like looking in the mirror at what we see sometimes and we reject what we see, especially if it doesn't look good or well or bad. I just know that if we were to ex extinct, extinct, if we were to use the energy that we do when one white man kills a black man to, to stand up and do for ourselves and rebel when we kill each other, that our race could turn around. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm doing the best that I can, maybe not the best that I can, but I'm working as hard as I can. Pastors are working with me, some are. But if all of us as pastors would do something from the pulpit in terms of preaching about the status of our people and leading them out of the destitution that we're in the midst of, I think that it could help to turn our race around. And I don't see our race being turned around unless it comes from the pulpit in some shape, some form, some fashion. So you told me some about the African-American churches transforming society. Is this, this the group of pastors that you were talking about? Yes, it's called ACTS, A-A-C-T-S, yes. that's right. Well, just say, you can say a little bit you know, about that. I'm, I'm, I'm open to hearing it. Well, it is an organization that we started 
and um, it's mm -hmm. geared around parenting, yes. uh, leading our people out of the destitution that they are in the midst of. Just to give you just a little bit about that. Um, I have a curriculum now um, that we have formulated on parenting and putting it in churches, asking people to use it for uh, in Sunday school or Bible studies, uh, wherever they think well to, it can be used. And it's getting out there now pretty well. I've even made contact with um, the school systems the superintendent of schools that we invited, they have thought well of it and have told us that they were going to use it in some of the school systems, especially with the PTAs, the parent teachers associations. Mm -hmm. And um, so it's getting some traction and we're coming along. Good, good. I've got some questions from uh, some of our students and I want to take a couple of those. If you, if you, you're still okay, you know. I'm all right. Okay, good. Uh, one question is, you had a personal connection with Aretha and the Franklin family. Can you talk about your process of separating your personal grief from the sermonic moment? From the what moment? The, your personal grief from the sermonic moment. My personal grief? Yeah, in other words, you had a connection with the family. So in other words, how do you as a preacher, you're grieving and you have to preach. Do, how do you separate your personal grief from the preaching moment, or maybe you don't separate your personal grief from the preaching moment? Well, it was no grieving on my part or like that. You know, I didn't have a problem in terms of grieving. Okay. I really didn't. I, that's difficult for me okay. to, to, to answer that. I want to answer whoever asked the question, but I just, I can't associate myself with grieving. I wasn't grieving about her death. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. So what, what emo was there an emotion or, you know, um, tell me what, obviously you have a connection with her and the family. So was there, was there an emotion or it was, okay, I just need to, we got a opportunity in a worldwide audience. We need to just get this done. Uh, so tell me about that. Well, I wasn't about to allow being on that world stage, stop me from not, uh, articulating what was in my heart mm. as okay. related to that situation. Right. Okay. And you say it was, you say a dangerous sermon, surviving behind yeah. a dangerous sermon. Well, when I got back to my church, they greeted me like never before. I mm. mean, I, I, I've never had them to be as receptive to me as they were. <laughs> at that time, it could be they were just feeling sorry for me or whatever. I don't know, but yeah. I was all right with that. You know, so when I say a dangerous sermon that, you know, I, 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 I'm, what I mean by that is that we have to preach sermons that upset the status quo mm -hmm. or upset somebody. Mm -hmm. I know. I understand. And um, if our preaching upsets nobody, you know, so my argument is every sermon don't have to be a dangerous sermon because you couldn't survive as a pastor if all your sermons were dangerous. I mean, so Kenyatta Gilbert says you got to preach as, as the as the priest. You got to massage wounds you, as the sage, as the wise one who has the truth from God revealed out of the word. And also sometimes as a prophet, which is usually uncomfortable, which is upsetting the status quo. So. I heard in the response in the African-American community, our bifurcated responses. Yes. You know, in that, that sermon had to be dangerous for this level of discussion, um, conversation, some hostility. I mean, it was, it, was, it was a mix that was worthy of studying. And then you did something with two press conferences, you know, which allowed windows into what you were thinking and feeling about the sermon. So I tried to put all that together and look at it and then say to people, uh, if you're going to preach something dangerous, um, make sure that you try to understand the other side of your <laughs> argument. So you go treated, ahead. You treated it very, very well. It was objective, but objective in a very unique way. It really, really was. So I, I, I congratulate you on it. 
So when you say unique, because, you know, so let me tell you my, my sense. I, I said to people, and I say to people, nobody gets up on Sunday morning to do a bad job, or we would say flunk. The person who's preaching is most of the time sincerely trying to help somebody. Most of it. So let's look at it. Let's look at it in that. Let's look at what was trying to be accomplished. Maybe it was accomplished. Maybe it wasn't accomplished. But let's, if we're going to work together, let's try to understand deeper. Let's look at motives. You know, we have a long tradition and history of disagreement about the best way to liberate black people. So we always have had that and always will have that. But I want to see us have conversation with each other, not bifurcate each other or judge each other or call each other names because everybody's needed in the struggle. So I tried to write the chapter that we could learn from the situation and we could, um, you know, somehow be in dialogue, you know, about it rather than be polarized over it and be open to learning from each other. It was very well presented. It really was. Well, thank you. You know, my goal was to send it to you ahead of time. I didn't. I didn't want you to be surprised in in the public when this things come. This thing comes out. I think that's a part of integrity and scholarship. All right. So let's take a few more questions. Um, we, you know, we've got Pastor Williams, who's got seventy years of preaching experience. Um, so, any more questions? Um, so, one of the questions is: You realize that you were speaking to a global audience as well as the African-American community. So what message in the eulogy did you have for the global audience, you know, people in Africa or people all over the globe who might have been watching the Aretha Franklin funeral? It didn't make me any difference about that part in terms of uh, the only thing about the globalization of the moment was that uh, I had no other platform, no other way to address what I felt we as a people need to become cognizant of than that moment. Okay. And that was my judgment. Now, one of the students says, Dr. Williams, during your eulogy, you were speaking directly to the soul of humanity. Today, during this moral crisis, what would you say to the soul of humanity? You mean the, the crises of the COVID-19? Yes, yes. Well, I've done a series of messages on it, four of them, and the, the main one is entitled God's Answer to the COVID-19 Crises, and it comes from Second Chronicles, chapter 7, verse 14, that all of us, I think, are familiar with. Yes. If my people with the call by my name shall armor themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven forgive their sin, and heal their land. I think it's a pretty good sermon. Mm -hmm. um, I did not know that you had written, you know, because I pride myself in being a scholar full of research, I did not know that you had written a chapter on the uh, eulogy in, that, in your book, so I will get that and read that. I wish I'd have had it ahead of time. I could have included it as part of the, uh, you know, as part of the study. I want to, you know, we've got about seven minutes left, and um, I, I, I've got, as I wait for questions and things to come in, what is it that you would like to say about preaching that I have not asked you? Well, when you develop the word that you are preaching, one of the things that I think we all as preachers must be cognizant of these days is the inclusion of current events. You know, what's going on in the world? what's happening now, and you've got to be able to mesh that into whatever your presentation is. Um, if you can't take the word of God and make it relevant for the times of which we live, <clears throat> then you are lacking a whole lot. You've got to be able to do that as a preacher. It takes a lot of thought, a lot of time, and if you if if you if you are burdened about the time as a preacher that it takes to prepare, then you need to rethink whether you should be preaching, because it should be something that you enjoy doing. There's no better feeling to me than it, in the time that I put in to prepare. I enjoy 
the preparation of process more than whatever success I get any other way. And so I hope that you uh, ministers who are listening can uh, pick up on that, that that's, that's a part of it. It's the main part of it, the preparation. How, how did you feel when you came down from the pulpit uh, in, the, in the Franklin eulogy? In Aretha? Yes. Well, good question. That's an excellent question. Um, when I came off the stage, Charles Adams, who was in Detroit long years ago, he's very feeble now. He came up to me and he ran his hand in his pocket and then he gave me a hundred dollar bill. Mm. And he told me and the people who were around, that's the kind of preaching that we need. That's the kind of preaching that we need. And we hugged each other and, and all. And uh, I gave him, of course, his hundred dollars back and gave him something else because I really appreciated him saying that to me. But that, were, that, was, that was the first response that I got. It was after that that I began to hear everything else that came. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, the question that I wanted to ask you too, how did um, sitting there for seven hours ahead of the eulogy affected and this may be not, you can tell me if you will and answer this, you know, could it, could it, um, could you have gone and gotten some rest? And, you know, so tell me, tell me sitting there for seven hours, how did that affect? Um, well, I didn't sit there for seven hours. Okay. I knew it was going to be a long time. So I had made arrangements with the pastor to stay in the back. All of that is explained in the book. Okay. In that okay. particular chapter. Um, and then I came out about midway the time and sat there for, 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 for that, whatever length of time it was. But um, however time, it, it was long, long, long. It was, as we all know, but um, it was all okay. Okay. That, that didn't affect me, I don't think. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, we're coming close to our agreed upon time and you've been so very generous with your time. And um, I wanna thank you so much. I'm gonna uh, put the Surviving Dangerous Sermon book back up. I'm gonna ask if um, we could get that put, my producer could put that back up so that you all, uh, I hope that you all will, will uh, purchase the book. And uh, it's really about having these kind of conversations. We don't all agree and it's hard to get in one conversation um, the bridges that we need, but the goal is to always find ways to preach effectively, to preach dangerously, and also to help and heal as many people as possible. So I suggest all kinds of strategies for that. We, if you're interested in more of these interviews, I've done a lot of them and I hope to do more. Um, this is a new format for us because we used to do them in person and now that COVID is uh, the reality, we're back to uh, doing the internet I'm gonna do internet interviews. And um, so I'm not sure, you know, keep, keep looking. I'm, I've enjoyed this so much. I wanted to, to just try to see how I felt about it, but uh, it feels good, it feels natural. I wanna thank Pastor Williams again for um, just offering your time and, um, and your energy and your perspectives. And my hope and my prayer is, um, I love the black community, I love the black church. And uh, I just want us all to just find ways to constructively talk and work together because this, all of us are going to be needed to move the ball forward, um, given the realities of uh, nationalism and such things that we face. So I'm going to give you the next to last word. And then I want to close with a word of prayer for all preachers and anybody else um, in this time. So Pastor Williams, I, I'm going to give you the last word. And maybe if, the Lord, if you feel led to, you can close us in a word of prayer. All right, but uh, let me say to you that as soon as this uh, coronavirus allows the church to come back in terms of um, all of us being able to go back to the church, I would really, really love for you to come and be my guest here at Salem. Oh, I'd be honored, sir. I really would love for you to do that. And I'll so- I'd be honored. I'd be okay. very, very honored. I'd be honored. Thank you. 
the, the, the next or the last thing that I would like to do is, uh, would you send me about 25 copies of your book? And I'm going to, um, how much are the books? Uh, $17.99 or something like that. All right. I'm going to, let me send you the money for, for okay. the books first. And then you send me 25 copies of it. Will you do that? I will do that, sir. All right. And board, you'll handle that for me? Yes, sir. Very good. All right. Um, and one last thing to the preachers who are listening. The sincerity of the pulpit is key and paramount for us these days. These are difficult days that we're in. Everybody's not built for times like these. And you as a preacher, pastor, whoever you are, the fact that you're in the school like you are means everything. You're doing what I wish I had done. I was too stubborn, too hard-headed. I felt I knew too much. I was all beside myself. I went to the seminary, stayed there for two weeks and quit because mm -hmm. I ran a revival. And then I kept running revivals and revivals and revivals and never got out of the seminary, never went back to the seminary. The struggle, I don't care what it is, how difficult it is, family problems, financial problems, you hang on in there. God needs you in that pulpit. And the fact that you have dedicated as much time as you have to be in that classroom like you are tells me that God certainly got a pulpit for you. Mm -hmm. And there's a need for you to aggrandize his kingdom. Mm -hmm. So whoever you are and wherever you are, if you would just lay your hand on the screen, on, the, on your phone, I don't know. But one thing I do know, mm -hmm. he knows. <laughs> I know he's there. Mm -hmm. If you would just close your eyes now. Eternal God, our Father, all wise, everlasting one. In these days when civilization has been torn by degradation as it flirts with doom and disaster, in times like these where June bugs are running in the summer sun, selfishness evaporates the milk of human kindness while pain and panic chase each other like June bugs in the summer sun. I come thanking you. Dr. Frank Thomas and for the work that he's doing for the students who are laying aside their lives in sacrifice, putting it on the altar for you that you, oh God, will come by one day and bless them and raise them to where they can be used in your pulpit like mm -hmm. only you can do. Yes, God. I put each student in your hand. Mm -hmm. Now, henceforth and forevermore, we entrust them with you and we know all will be well. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you, Doc. Thank you so much. Thank you. I'll be in touch. I'll call you tomorrow. Thank you.